How can you follow the will of God? Follow it the best you know how for the next 15 minutes. That's what Adrian Rogers once said. I think that's pretty sound counsel. Tonight, we're going to be reminded how God connects the dots, brings people into the same area for a specific purpose. Pastor Mark Hensley here with my beautiful wife, Laura, from our study down in the basement in our house in Fountain, Colorado. I'm hoping you're uh, ready for Christmas. It is just around the corner. And I hope you're ready and got the presents bought. I went out and bought presents for Laura today. That's not a, it's kind of difficult because it's a challenge to find something you don't need. But it was a lot of fun to do that and um, just to, to be out and about. Uh, but busy times for sure. Uh, continue to pray for um, the outreach event that happens each week as we go and take food to the homeless. We'll be doing that tomorrow afternoon in downtown uh, Colorado Springs on South Nevada. And so pray for that outreach. It uh, helps a lot of people. And then I want to thank you for your generosity in recent uh, weeks. Uh, our, the church has caught up on some of the, uh, the challenges financially. And I want you to know that over $4,500, Laura, have you heard this yet, has been given to Lottie Moon. Lottie Moon is the annual Christmas offering that goes to international missions. 100% of what's given goes. Our goal worldwide, nationwide, I should say, Southern Baptist is, I believe, $185 million. <clears throat> Can you imagine in the church where we're at on El Morro Road, over $4,500 will go to help missions around the world. That's exciting. Thank you for your generosity. Thank you for uh, kind notes and wonderful wishes this Christmas season. And remember uh, how much we value you and appreciate you. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for all that you are and how you can direct us and guide us and open doors and close doors. And it's not always... Uh, in our purview to know your ways. Your ways are higher than ours. Your thoughts are above ours. But we know this, you love us, and you know how to connect the dots relationally, occupationally, geographically. So I pray specifically for someone tonight who's needing that direction. I pray comfort for Carolyn Southworth, who has had um, another brother step into eternity. I pray for her and, and her family as they grieve. Pray for others during this difficult Christmas season when they're reminded of, of uh, an empty seat at a table. Lord, we pray that you'd be honored in all that's done. We want to thank you because you have freed all of the hostages in Haiti. They're all going to be home for Christmas. We specifically asked you for that and tens of thousands and maybe millions have asked you for that, and you granted that, and we just want to thank you. And so we lay this uh, season at your feet. Help us to be bright, two-legged testimonies of the changing power of Christ, and thank you for sending your wonderful son 2,000 years ago. What a difference he's made in so many millions and now billions of lives. We pray for uh, the end to the pandemic, that the Omicron a variant would uh, just fizzle out. Pray for the president and other leaders to know what to do to best position uh, us here in the United States for uh, good health and good outcomes. We thank you for tonight and are grateful for these moments. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we return to the book of Acts tonight, Acts chapter 8. Last week, we um, left Simon the sorcerer uh, kind of uh, nursing his wounds after Peter told him in no uncertain terms, you cannot purchase the Holy Spirit. Don't try. You need to repent. And we were reminded that um, grace and joy and ministry and life and purpose happens because of the indwelling presence of Christ. It's not something we try to make happen. God is the change agent. So tonight we're introduced to a, a new gentleman, a Ethiopian eunuch who will travel 1,200 miles from his home in Ethiopia to Jerusalem to meet Philip. And God is connecting these two people from diverse backgrounds. It's a reminder that the Lord can at any moment interject his will in our lives and connect us 
at just the most opportune time. So I hope you have your Bibles open. We're in the book of Acts, chapter 8, and I begin reading in verse 26. Now an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. So he arose and went. And behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, was, who had had charge of all her treasury, had come to Jerusalem to worship. This is an influential political leader that God decides to reach. Remember that, folks. I can't underscore this enough. We look at famous people, politicians, our own family members that for whatever reason are outside of relationship with God. And we can, if we're not careful, become cynical and doubtful and wondering, will they ever respond? Well, remember, the Lord knows the key to every human heart. So pray that God would move mightily in your own life, in the life of the church, in the life of your family, in the life of your friends, political leaders, famous athletes. You never know how God can use your life and inject you into someone's life, uh, even like he did with uh, Queen Esther. You know, remember Mordecai came to her and said, who knows that you have not been born for such a time as this? Basically, use your influence, Esther, because uh, they are wanting to destroy the Jewish people. And she did. And God prevented it from happening. So here's the eunuch <coughs> who is sitting in a chariot. And um, while he's in the chariot, he's reading from the book of Isaiah, the Old Testament prophet. He's one of the major prophets. There's a distinction between major and minor prophets because of the scope of their writings. A major prophet just was more verbose, wrote longer books. Minor prophets, smaller books. That's the difference. Isaiah is a major prophet. So then the Spirit said to Philip, go near and overtake this chariot. Talk about specific directives. See the chariot? See the man over there? Get to it. And he goes. I often tell my Liberty students, Two words that will change the trajectory of your life are the words, yes, Lord, yes, Lord. And so Philip does go, and he talks to the man, and uh, he says to him, and sometimes one of the best ways to open up a conversation is with a question. Do you understand what you're reading? And his reply is interesting, and he says, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come and sit with him. <laughs> the place in the scripture which he read was this. He asked him to come sit with him. God is all over that interaction, all over that encounter. And you just be ready. Ron Dunn, the Oklahoma evangelist, said, so many times we get disconcerted and, and, dis, and uh, kind of uh, discouraged because maybe God hasn't used us in a particular way. He said, just think of it this way. It's like in your, in your kitchen, you have a sink and you have a, a, a water faucet. And all you have to do to get water is just lift the handle and the water comes out. Don't get mad at the master of the house if he's not thirsty that day or he doesn't want to use that particular faucet. Just be ready when he does and be sure to know the hope that is within you and verbalize it when you get a chance. So here's the passage that the, the Ethiopian eunuch is reading. He was, led to, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and as a lamb before the shearer, he was silent. So he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away, and who would declare his generations, for his life is taken from the earth. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this of himself or some other man? He was inquisitive. He wanted to know, what is this about? Then Philip opened his mouth and began using this scripture, preaching Jesus to him. This is the famous Isaiah 53, where it talks how the Lord did not open his mouth. He was like a sheep going to slaughter. And it's, uh, the, it's a messianic psalm. <coughs> Pardon me, when you read that, Messianic means Messiah, 
and of course the psalm, uh, excuse me, it wasn't a psalm, it was from the book of Isaiah. There are messianic psalms that I'm thinking of. For instance, right next to the most famous psalm, Psalms 23, is Psalms 22. It's a messianic psalm. When you read Psalms 22, written a thousand years before the advent of Jesus in a Bethlehem stable, it tells you how he's going to die. They gamble for his clothes. He'll be buried with a with the rich people. They will pierce him for our transgressions. I mean, it's fascinating. All of that in Psalm 22. Well, Isaiah 53 is called the suffering servant. <clears throat> and it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ and how God would allow him to suffer for us. And he is explaining it to him. And that's why it's so imperative to know the word of God so when you have an opportune time, you can interject your testimony and the word into people's lives. Philip opened his mouth. Sometimes you just got to talk. You just got to speak up. And began at this scripture, preaching Jesus to him. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water. And the eunuch said, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Along the way, by inference, you understand that Philip had talked to him about salvation, about the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, about hope in the Lord, and how imperative it is to be baptized after salvation. Make sure you get your salvation on the right side of baptism. Salvation is a free gift of God, uh, not of works, lest any man should boast. Baptism doesn't save us. But it identifies us with the Lord. When I talk to children about getting baptized, I'll often tell them it's like putting on your jersey for Jesus. <laughs> when you're lowered into the water, it's a picture of Jesus being lowered into the grave. When you're brought up out of the water, it is a picture of his resurrection. Here, this Ethiopian eunuch who's traveled 1,200 miles and in a moment of God's spectacular ingenuity and connectedness has brought him into the life of Philip and Philip into his life. And he's convicted him of sin. He's drawn him to Christ. And now he's ready to be baptized. And Philip adds a caveat. He says, Then Philip said, If you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. What a powerful declaration. Let people know where you stand. Let them know who you serve. This Christmas season, let them know that it's all about Jesus. He really is the reason for the season. And he's the one that split time between B.C. and A.D. And he's the soon coming king. And I encourage you to be really open and sensitive to how God will orchestrate the events of your life and connect you with people who are inquisitive, open, seeking, and maybe hurting this time of year. So he commanded the chariot to stand still. And Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. Wouldn't you have loved to have been there for that? Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away so that the eunuch saw him no more and he went on his way rejoicing. This brief moment in time when God allows a government official high-ranking, all the way from Ethiopia to meet Philip, a godly, spirit-filled deacon. And on that day, there was a movement of God to draw the Ethiopian to Christ. And I can assure you, he then not only rejoiced post-baptism, but he went back to Ethiopia telling people about the risen Lord Jesus Christ and a unique encounter with a man named Philip outside of Jerusalem. Folks, what some people call the will of God, we know. Uh, what some people call coincidence, I should say, we know is the will of God. I'll always be grateful <clears throat> that when my family moved here from North Carolina in 1976, my dad bought a house three doors up from a blue-eyed blonde that I'm looking at right now. That was a providential real estate decision. In fact, in my blog, which is like an online diary, I list 12 memorial stones in my life. And Laura is like number three, I think. And I, I titled that section of my life's journey, 
the most wonderful real estate decision my dad ever made. <laughs> and it's worked out great these 40 years, hasn't it? Because he brought us into the same area. Who might he be bringing you to know this coming year? Who are you asking God to reach that seems untouchable, that seems so hard-hearted and so distant? God can do anything. He knows how to soften a heart, and he knows how to place you near a broken one to tell them of the hope of the Lord Jesus Christ. I love how this encounter takes place. I love the synchronicity you see in the text, how God uses um, time and space and people and connectedness to move his will along the road. They leave each other for a moment. He wouldn't see them anymore on earth, but they've already been rejoicing in heaven for 2,000 years. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. What's interesting about that is supernaturally, God just picked Philip up and gave him a, a lift. <laughs> he took an Uber. He let God be his Uber. <laughs> it didn't cost him anything. And God knows how to get you to where he wants you to go. I've so enjoyed this quote my whole life. I may not be where I thought I would be, but I think I'm where I'm supposed to be. And so are you until the Lord releases you to a new assignment or a new opportunity. And I encourage you to have a blast while you last and look into the Word of God and see the connectedness of our God and know that there's no one that He cannot reach. And I'm so encouraged by that. And I uh, want to encourage you to have a wonderful Christmas. Focus on other people. Help other people. I read of a lady one time who was depressed at Christmas, and she decided, well, it's not my birthday after all. And so she went down to a nursing home and just loved on the people there and took them cookies and gifts and gave of herself, and her depression lifted. I have found that true in my own life. When I focus on other people, the end result is often I am more benefited than they are. So this Christmas season, remember how much God loves you, how God has in your own life, connected the dots and how he continues to do that, both now, this year, and the one to come. Let's pray. Father, thank you for tonight. <clears throat> I thank you for the privilege to be with friends. And I thank you for your word. <clears throat> I thank you that you know where we are and you know where we need to be. And you know how to get us to where we need to be. <laughs> Help us to just rest in that and quit struggling and quit um, fretting. Worry, Father, is an insult to you. Help us to trust. Comfort those who are brokenhearted this Christmas, especially. Help us to walk through the crowd slowly and see people and really notice them. And if we can help someone, Lord, show us how. Because along the way, we've sure had a lot of help from a lot of folks. Thank you for their memory. Thank you for their impact. And thank you for this Christmas season. It gives us hope. And I'm grateful for this time with our friends. Bless them richly is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you want to remind you our Christmas Eve service is at 530. And we're going to have a wonderful time uh, together. So plan to come and bring some friends. And have a great rest of your night. Pastor Mark Hensley here with the blue-eyed blonde who lived three doors down from me in 1976 and since 1981 has lived right where I live. Thank you for staying with me all these years. <laughs> the best is yet to be the end of life for which the first was made. Have a great evening. Merry Christmas to all of you. <laughs>